Okay. Are we live right now? Cool. Wait, does that mean we're live? <laughs> Here, let me, I'm gonna check. Whatever, that. YOLO. Yeah, all right. I don't, I don't, I think Christian would probably tell us if we were probably. We may be live, we may not be live. Yeah, if we are live, sorry for anyone who's listening to us. No, it doesn't look like it yet. Okay, cool. Oh shit. No, we are live. You're live. You're live. We absolutely are live. All right. What is up, everybody? Welcome to the All right, uh, cool. Next I bit. To see me. It's not too dark. <laughs> well, ne- welcome to the next bit of the having live stream. Um, I'm Colin Harper, a former journalist of Bitcoin magazine, turned freelance journalist, and I'm delighted to be joined with the one and only Elizabeth Stark of Lightning Labs. How are you doing, Elizabeth? I'm good. I mean, it's it's been quite a day already. You know, that super short block as the last one before the halving. That was fun. Yeah, that was nuts. I was looking, I was like looking at how many blocks we had left uh, as we were jumping on Hangouts to do this. And I like refreshed the page afterwards and saw that it already happened. It was nuts. Um, yeah, we had our uh, Lightning Labs team uh, group video chat and we were tracking it. So, and in fact, we were talking about the probability of super short blocks. Connor, like on our team, our head of cryptographic engineering sent out some research on it, of course. <laughs> yeah, obviously, absolutely, of course. I mean, you, you expect nothing less, right? Uh, 2.5% uh, uh, probability, I believe of 15 second blocks, although don't quote me on that, I'll check with Connor. <laughs> what was the final block? Did you know how quick it was? Uh, you... It was short. I, I, it was like tens of seconds, I believe, but. That's yeah. crazy. Um, well, yeah, welcome to the fourth epic, everybody. Um, epoch, I should say. Um, and part of what we're going to be talking about today, you know, we, we want to touch on more than just lightning a little Bitcoin because, you know, having just happened, we're feeling good about it. Um, but one thing that I want to talk to you today, uh, talk about with you today, Elizabeth, is in this fourth epoch, what is it going to take for something like lightning to get to that mainstream adoption where we start seeing more circular economies? I know that's a huge question, um, but I guess my opening question for you is what do you believe is like are some of the primary challenges for lightning today that are standing in front of that goal? Yeah, um, well, one thing that's really cool is um, in reflecting on, you know, the past having uh, the 210,000 blocks, um, that was really when like the first lightning development started. It was around the last having like the early development, you know, before alpha, um, certainly before beta, before mainnet and all of that. And, um, you know, so much has changed since then. I mean, it's been wild to see things evolve um since the last having uh protocol development does just take time and there aren't you know so many protocol devs also with the bitcoin protocol um but i actually see i think this having is really interestingly timed you know we all knew the having would happen we didn't know exactly when but we didn't know about a pandemic and kind of global economic chaos and all of that and to me this opens up a massive opportunity right Um, You know, a lot of people are saying right now that, you know, we're seeing uh, a decade worth of change in in a month or something. And then I'm thinking, well, actually, if it's possible in a month, that's actually a month's worth of change. So I think right now we're well poised for a moment for both Bitcoin and Lightning. But, you know, at the end of the day, challenges are, are there because I would, you know, Bitcoin itself right now, like right now we're hearing of a lot of people getting interested in Bitcoin, for example, like the boomer population, like there's a whole Bitcoin boomer um, movement that I think is emerging, which is really interesting. And I'm excited. There's also the light, there's a lightning boomer side of things as well. Um, And I actually see usability. I mean, this is something I've talked about a lot in the past, but, you know, making the technology easier to use, enabling people to hold their own coins, you know, not your keys, not your coins, um, but also building out more resilient infrastructure um even in terms of the centralized institutions you know things are going down as we saw um you know it's still somewhat difficult to use we want things to be more resilient so i think in terms of lightning you know we knew for beta it was command line only right and that was intentional by the way then we saw the evolution of uh wallets and and user applications and uis and use cases and uh, i'm really excited about a lot of those that have emerged But to me, I think the next four years will be about making this technology easier to use. 
and you know there are design related elements to that other technical elements but then liquidity and for folks that have heard me speak in the past uh, around lightning they know that liquidity is something i'm really passionate about um with lightning you've got amazing ski speed amazing scalability uh, very low fees but you do have this liquidity aspect to lightning you need inbound capacity in order to receive funds and of course you need funds outbound in channel in order to send um so to me i see one of the challenges as ensuring that we have the proper liquidity as one of our devs uh, yoast at lightning labs like to say um the goal is to get the basic payment or you know basic transaction perfectly executed right so the end user shouldn't have to think about it so for example today in the credit card system you swipe your card and it works, but there are like 20 or more intermediaries that are involved that are behind the scenes. And, and actually, uh, one of our investors sent uh, this graph, which is really interesting because I didn't even know all the different parties that were involved in that singular credit card transaction. So we want to remove a wide variety of those intermediaries and make it work. But, you know, it, it's going to take time to get there. So back in uh, October at the Lightning Conference in Berlin, a lot of people were actually talking about those challenges. Um, one thing that I love about our community is they've been very honest. They're not gonna say like everything will just work magically tomorrow. I like to think of it as honest optimism. And um, and so a lot of people were talking about the challenges, but also the solutions. So to me, I think getting to basic payment perfectly executed is where we wanna be, say in the next four years. And in many ways, you can think of even like something like Google, right? Where, okay, you type in a term, you know, it's centralized and you have a search result, but actually all that goes into it is super complex. And I think the whole idea is to abstract away kind of everything that's under the hood and just make it work. So that's where I want to get to. Yeah, absolutely. And I want to go back to this uh, problem of liquidity because outbound inbound liquidity, uh, some of the largest problems for routing, obviously. Um, again, going back to this idea of, uh, of, of intermediaries, um, how big of a role do you think companies like lightning service providers are going to play a role in this, you know, um, in, in, in this, whatever we want to call it, Web 3.0 new new epoch of, of online commerce. You know, because we've seen that thrown around a lot. I, I remember in the Lightning Conference, that was also a big topic of conversation is, you know, custodial versus non-custodial. What kind of services are going to be available for what kind of level of users? So what, 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 what role do you see Lightning service providers playing in the future? As solving way, some as aside, like, I don't know what Web 3.0 means, so... <laughs> Yeah, I we can yeah, web, web 3.0 is fine. Thing. Like I don't know. So yeah, I, I know that there shout out actually to Ryan Gentry who wrote a cool blog post around new emerging use cases around lightning, such as chat and um certain types of like sending data over lightning and, and people love to discuss and debate that. And I know there are other communities that talk about that term, but like honestly, I don't know what that means. So um in terms of a lightning service provider, my understanding is the kind of name for that is a company that um, is kind of managing a degree of liquidity and running services. But I actually see that, and um, so Breeze, uh, the wallet company, Noxodial Wallet, shout out to them, um, I think have used that term pretty extensively. Um, but I actually also see there's kind of a broader set of things, which is is the lightning kind of capital provider. I, I, that's not a, a term of art. I just made that up. But um, so today, you know, we have interest rates that are zero and in many places negative or going negative. Right. Um, I actually just saw an article around MakerDAO and how there's discussion in that community of, say, having to go to negative interest rates or at least like, you know, very, very low or zero. Oh, no shit. Really? Yeah. Yeah. I just saw that. And um so I think the whole idea is, well, you can provide capital to the network, you can deploy that capital and ideally earn a return. So Alex Bosworth, one of our devs, um, earned a bunch of fees, like a, a lot um, recently. I think it was in uh, the month of, uh, I think it was April, March or April. And um, of course there's going to be this interplay between on-chain and off-chain fees and you know, lightning fees should be kept ideally quite low, but lightning fees are percentage based, whereas on-chain fees, as I'm sure folks know, are based on space. So there's also an interesting arbitrage situation there. So I actually think what we'll see is new opportunities for both LSPs along the lines of folks that are kind of managing liquidity and opening channels and then capital providers um, to, to earn a return on their funds um, on the network. And the goal is, by the way, Wumbo 2020, um, for those that are not familiar, that is our uh, 
campaign slogan. And um, so Wumbo is a large channel size on Lightning. Um, some of the implementations have enabled that in part on our LND implementation for Lightning Labs. Uh, we have not yet coming soon, fingers crossed. Um, but that is enabling folks to open larger channels. And the goal is you know, to have stability, security backups, all of that, that enables you to do that, but it's opt-in. So you're not going to unintentionally open this channel. You need to know what you're doing. And it opens the door for uh, larger transactions, uh, exchanges. We saw Bitfinex uh, back in December as the first major exchange. A bunch of other exchanges, including Bitdem Bitmex, are running Lightning nodes publicly. I know Kraken has Pierre Rochard over there. I was just speaking in VR yesterday with them, and they're very excited about this. Um, so to me, Wumbo here is going to be significant because you'll see more transactions and the ability to send larger amounts. Uh, by the way, uh, do you know where Wumbo comes from, Colin? From well, from SpongeBob. Has to. Yeah, I exactly. I like missed the SpongeBob boat. I don't know, but uh, <laughs> credit to Walu, aka Rosie, who I think um, came up with that. I Wumbo, you Wumbo. I'm learning SpongeBob as we go. Like one of the things. That's about amazing. I mean, look at that. Get a job in Bitcoin. Learn finance, cryptography, and econ, and SpongeBob. Incentives and SpongeBob. Um, so to me, I think that's going to be really key here. And um, so another cool thing is uh, MPP uh, multi-path payments that actually uh, recently shipped in the latest LND release 0.10. Uh, we put a blog post out about that last week, and you can effectively chop up payments. So getting to the point around liquidity, that's a really exciting development because okay, now if you want to send a thousand dollars. You don't need capacity of $1,000 in one singular channel. You can chop that up into smaller parts. Um, so yeah, I mean, to me, at the end of the day, the way that I view Lightning is it's this new uh, kind of capital market structure that's emerging. Um, it's going to be used for payments for transactions. But I also, we're seeing an emerging kind of class of new types of Lightning assets or financial instruments. Um, for example, there's been a Quite a bit of discussion on the dev lightning dev mailing list around discrete log contracts um, originally created by Taj over at MIT, one of the paper uh, co-authors. Um, people are looking at uh, new constructions around that. Um, so to me, I think we're really setting the stage and building a new financial layer two infrastructure. And um, you know, LSPs will be a part of that. I think people building out these new um, kind of Financial products are going to play a big role as well. Also, people are now debating what you call Lightning Finance. It's definitely not DeFi. Is it LiFi? LiFi? Yeah. So what somebody yesterday Fi? came up with that, and then some other people hated it because it's Bitcoin, and you know, some people. FlashFi? I don't know. Like, just I don't mind like LiFi, but you know, let the viewers decide and maybe give feedback on. on what yeah, I want. mean, Bitcoin's a very, um, I don't know, creative community. We'll have a meme for yeah. it here in a week, probably already as we get off this. Yeah, stream, exactly. So let's come up with a name and create the meme. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, I think the goal here is, you know, this is all backed by, you know, the Bitcoin base layer, the security of the Bitcoin chain, like on the day of, you know, the having, and that's significant. And you're not going to get that security and you're not going to get those guarantees elsewhere. And I think that's part of what's so key. Not even on DeFi platforms? <laughs> <laughs> no, we don't have reentrancy bugs that I, you know, <laughs> here. Absolutely not. Um, well, kind of building on top of that, is it an exaggeration to say that the early days of something like the Lightning Network r r reminds people of the early days of Bitcoin? Because that was the sentiment flying no. around at Lightning Con. Yeah. So in Berlin, uh, we expected 400 people back in October, back when we used to get together, see people, you know, have, <laughs> have fun, spend uh, funds on Lightning, kind of get beers with the, the beer, automated beer machine, the cocktail bot, the Lightning coffee, which was craft coffee, by the way. Um, coffee. But no, so. One thing that's been really cool is there are a whole host of people that actually got interested in Bitcoin through Lightning. And I actually didn't realize that until I started talking to folks. And there, a lot of them were kind of interested in kind of web development or usability or app development and things that Lightning made possible. So I love the fact that we're actually bringing in kind of a new crop of uh, Bitcoin folks uh, via Lightning. So, you know, the more the better. Um, 
so yeah, I mean, I'm really excited about our community. I think, you know, there's so much creativity within what people have built. Um, you know, shout out to uh, Desiree the, and the Mint Gox folks. They're now uh, gaming tournaments that are going on with Lightning. The Lightning gaming community is growing substantially. Um, Sphinx.chat, for those that don't know, um, and there are a variety of these Lightning-based chat apps where you can actually, you know, you're not really going to spam people because you have to send sats, or if you're going to spam them, you'll do your hop <laughs> Losing money. Um, so well, speaking of kind of those, those gaming and messaging applications, um, what are some other potential? Because you know, um, going back to you know the facetious Web 3.0 thing, you start seeing people throw like lightning around for auxiliary use cases, right? Um, uh, g gaming uh, is one of them for payouts in gaming. You know, um, uh, another one that, that kind of gets thrown around is potentially for. I mean, this is a payments uh, solution, but still uh, kind of like micro payments for content curation on the web. Um, what are some what are some like use cases that you see for lightning? Maybe some of the obvious ones uh, that other people maybe don't point out, and some of the non obvious ones. I don't know. What are you excited to see this be be applied to in the next decade? Yeah. So one of the cool things about working on this tech is like sometimes you just wake up and you're like, whoa! I never thought you know thought that would happen, and you're like, now you can feed chickens with lightning. <laughs> you know, pollo feed. Although credit to Elaine O, oh, who was the OG bird feeder with Lightning, because she created a cool app around on Testnet originally. Um, and you know, th there have been all these like Satoshi's Place, um, Lightning Koala made that. And so it, I actually think I could sit here and try to predict these things, but like we honestly just don't know, and that's what's so interesting. You're like, oh wait, somebody made a novel where you can like pay a Satoshi per page or like pay per word or... Um, so three of the areas that I'm interested in right now, um, the first is, the, as mentioned, the gaming world. There are a lot of really cool companies out there um, doing uh, games of lightning, ZBD, Donner Labs, Satoshi's Games, and a bunch of others, and there's a Mick Gox crowd. Um, so, and they, you know, while folks are stuck at home, like perfect time to go online and, and play video games with lightning. Um, I think the lightning chat and like data on lightning aspect is really interesting. Now, uh, people, there are debates in the community, you know, can this scale, does this make sense? But we're opening up this new use case and, um, yeah, check out that post by Ryan Gentry, um, to learn more about what's going on in that world. Um, so to me, this is an emerging use case. Um, and you know, some people think, okay, chat is spam. Some people think it's not scalable, which is funny because it's lightning. But um, I like the idea of attaching payment to messaging. Mm -hmm. I think that's really interesting. And um, you know, at the end of the day, if you think about you know hash cash, right? Like, <laughs> if you're trying to prevent spam on email, it's, it's cool how like things come full circle with something like that. Yeah, like, that's true. And then you know, lightning finance, life by whatever you want to call it. I'm really interested in. So there are all these fiat to lightning uh, services, uh, river.com, Zap, Breeze, Escher, a variety of other folks that have done that. So that's kind of on the more centralized side because they're using you know actual fiat. Um, folks like LN Markets, um, they're doing a BitMEX competitor using lightning. So it's more transient. You kind of send in your funds and you can get them back quickly. Um, and then you have these new possible emerging use cases around um, other assets on Lightning. So I think that's been really interesting to me to see how that emerges. Also, things move really quickly. It's like, I don't know, in, in one week, there's like a new service or application that somebody's built, which has always been fun. Yeah, absolutely. And you're right to say that things move quickly. I remember one of the first articles I wrote for Bitcoin Magazine was kind of like when when, when laps were like a big thing, like when you had y'alls coming out and all of these other new things when when Lightning uh, Network uh, just finally graduated out of beta or into beta yeah. and people were finally starting to use it. And, oh, um, yeah. and one quick point. I know uh, you wrote a great piece, Colin, um, on the release of LSAT. Uh, for those that don't know. I'm glad are, you brought this up. Authentic. What? I'm glad you brought this up. I wanted to hit on this. Okay, this awesome. Really cool. Lightning service authentication tokens, not to be confused with an ICO token, different, like a web token. Um, and it enables you to pay and authenticate 
without having a username and password, which I think is really cool, right? Because especially in this day and age with like the constant data breaches and privacy breaches, if you wanna pay for something digitally, you know, everything from an API call to say a digital good to streaming audio video, you could pay for articles, um, you can do so with LSAT and you can authenticate. Um, so enabling, say, you know, with AWS, a service like that, you have to sign up, username, password, credit card. Now you can actually just pay per usage. So I know the community was really excited about that. And um, we recently released um, a draft version of the protocol and some tools around that. So I know people are building and we'll like, who knows what they'll build. So let's see, I'm excited. I'm excited too, because I mean, just any sort of like, I don't know, any sort of solution that allows us to authenticate our identity online without having to go through Google, Facebook, or Amazon is a big win for everyone involved. Or not um, only that, like every single time. You, so, okay, right now being at home, you know, a lot of folks are doing online shopping. Granted, okay, if, if you're going to deliver an item, you still need to, um, you know, like get, provide that information. But if it's streaming or something, and now it's like you need to provide, you know, your your email, like all sorts of personal info. Okay, you can use a throwaway or something, but the number of, you know, entities that you have to provide your inf information mm -hmm. to is insane, and I hate it, especially yeah. being a, a paranoid, you know, Bitcoiner. Yeah, well. exactly. Like leaking information left and right. Totally. Um, well, Elizabeth, I think we're butting up against our time. I think we've got maybe five minutes left, maybe a okay. little bit less. Um, what else would you like to touch on? Um, what is something that no one's talking about that you think they should be or not? Well, I'm really excited right now about the prospects for Bitcoin. I mean, I know people are talking about that. Um, but I really, I do think the halving came at an opportune time. Um, but to me, at the end of the day, if, if this isn't what Bitcoin was made for, then what was was it made for, mm -hmm. right? So we have, you know, like the massive money printing, but, uh, you know, so one thing I think fewer people are talking about, so a lot of folks are talking about, you know, the US money printer go for, of course, that meme has gone mainstream, um, but I'm really excited about the international use cases that are going to come out of this as well. Um, I think right now we're in a macroeconomic environment that's going to make it much harder for, for um, you know, smaller cap, like fiat currencies. Uh, and even before the crisis, for example, I was in Argentina uh, a couple months back, Miss traveling, great community over there. And they had had insane inflation 15% in one week, right? Um, so just a little bit uh, over a week ago, I was on a video chat with a group from Venezuela um, and they had folks from all over Latin America and their Bitcoin community, right? And by the way, I, I love talking to uh, the Latin American communities. We were also in Brazil for Lightning Labs. It was really great to, to meet folks from the Brazil, Brazilian Bitcoin community and the Venezuelan, et cetera. But to me, I think what folks aren't thinking about as much, people are saying, okay, money printer go burr. You have these major hedge fund investors like Paul Tudor Jones, et cetera, who by the way, like I, I didn't know who he was until like a month ago or less. So, um, so that's a big deal. You have these, this kind of Bitcoin boomer generation coming in. But to me, what I'm really um, interested in is what are the opportunities that we can unlock and what are the use cases that we can unlock for a lot of places around the world that are really going to need this now, especially in light of the global macroeconomic climate. And, you know, what role can Lightning play in that? Peter McCormack, um, I think it was back in December after La BitConf was in El Salvador and there was a community there of folks who... Um, use like Bitcoin, they were kind of given and paid with Bitcoin and there were street vendors who accepted Lightning and, you know, they were using Lightning because of the instant transaction. Mm -hmm. It's um, in El Punto Manga and uh, El Zonce. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay, so you know about that. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. It's so all, to me, yeah, it's totally cool. What I think fewer people are thinking about right now, you know, it's Money Printer Go Burr. You have kind of the finance world getting into this, which by the way, like welcome to them because look, Bitcoin is equal opportunity. Like if they want to come in, and, and buy Bitcoin and be a part, like, sure, sounds good. You know, we, we want to maintain things like privacy, fungibility, all of that. But I think it's really interesting that people are seeing, you know, why Bitcoin on a macro scale matters, right? The, the 21 million cap, if you read that letter by uh, the PTJ, I, I think he, 
it was quite eloquent. And, and he nailed it. I mean, yeah. I mean, it sounds like he'd been like reading Bitcoin talk and Twitter posts and like the Bitcoin standard for years, you know? I know. And you're like, okay, cool. This is finally like permeating the mainstream. But um, I do think we will see Bitcoin's impact internationally um, in a way in the next couple of years, uh, you know, that we previously had not seen, I believe. And part of that is really uh, improving usability, but who knows what's going to happen with fiat currencies, with dollar? Will it be inflation and deflation, you know, at the same time? Um, will there be asset inflation? We see like the stock market mooning while, you know, 20 plus percent of the U.S. is probably unemployed right now. So to me, what I want to think more about, um, and actually credit to Fred Ersom, he had a really good tweet that I think encapsulated this quite well, where he said, you know, everyone's talking about money printer go burr, but people aren't thinking as much about the the smaller um, currencies and what's happening on the global macro level. So to me, that's what I want to learn more about and think more about. So right. yeah, and Bitcoin's global, our community's global, and anybody can build on this stuff. Hell yeah. Well, I think that's probably a pretty good place to cap it. Um, I don't know if, uh, if, if Christian or Dustin are still with us to give us any times, but I think that does it. I think that's about 25 or so minutes. Elizabeth, thanks so much for taking the time. Really, for really. Sure. Yeah, happy having everyone. Um, we've come a long way, but there, you know, there's so much more in store. Bitcoin's never going to be boring, or at least not for a while to come. And that's part of why we're here. <laughs> Hell yes. Well, thanks so much, Elizabeth. And thanks everyone who's uh, watching and our viewers. Thanks so much and happy having y'all. It's a great day. Happy having. Woo. There are many places to buy Bitcoin. They collect your personal information and jeopardize your privacy. KYC is the illicit activity. BISC is open source. It does not collect user data. You keep your private keys, create or take offers to trade peer-to-peer, -peer, and keep your Bitcoin private and secure. This is Jamie. Jamie found Blockset by BRD. Jamie's team can read and write data across multiple blockchains through Blockset's single unified API. They can build custom custodial solutions with Blockset's open source wallet SDK. 
They can even launch their own chain, host nodes, and maintain their infrastructure with help from Blockset's dedicated professional services. All of this will help Jamie and Jamie's engineers bring their project to market in a fraction of the time, for a fraction of the cost. Visit Blockset.com to learn more. Hey, what's wrong? Just trying to get my family to understand Bitcoin. They think it's just for criminals. They know what the money printers do, right? Yeah, but they have no idea how that affects them. They just want a steady job and a nice house. Check this out. Type in whatismoney.info. This site is like a red pill for Bitcoin. It explains how our monetary system screws people. Nice. I'll send this to all my normie friends. <laughs> Thank you.